and Mark. Yeah, Mark. <laughs> Mark was actually our second second guitar player. Uh, before Scott was asked to leave the band, we did have a, a guy for a little while. His name was Jason St. George. And it's funny because he was in a band across the hall uh, in the original jam space. But they were, those were some of the guys that were like, oh, my God, like, what are they doing over there? Tell me, can you describe this jam space? Oh, the jam space. About? There's a famous uh, nightclub in Halifax called the Misty Moon. Everybody played there, like Jeff Healy and April Wine and, you know, all those, you know, 70s and 80s bands. And it was it was, it was, was a lot like the movie Roadhouse. It's just just a dive, piece of shit. It was all, like, all the hair, this hairspray girls and metal dude, like, all that typical cheese. Like, a lot of, you know, like you'd see in Wayne's World and stuff, yeah. right? So yeah, that's it true. was totally it. So I'm way too, like, kind of punk rock of a guy. I've been there for shows, but... People are looking at me like I'm just like out of this world. And I wasn't one of those, uh, you know, like 10 foot high mohawk and pierced crazy punk rock guys. I just, I just, I just looked not, not that traditional denim leather jacket, like feathered hair and hairspray. And it's, you know, I've got nothing against anybody to look however they want. That, that never really bothered me, but. Yeah, I just didn't really fit in there. So there was bands like that. There was cover bands rehearsing upstairs. And it's so funny. like, Because those dudes would like put on the makeup and all that stuff. So we would get a chuckle just because, okay, like you're, you're trying really hard. You know, it goes back to that whole, you know, like the beginnings of Fresh and like posers and you're playing music for chicks and all that. There's nothing wrong with like chicks and getting yeah. chicks and all that stuff. But when that becomes your sole motivation, it t it's comedy to us because we're into just what sounds just like nuts and, yeah. and it will appease you and tickle you in the right ways. Anyway, so that jam spot was the top floor of the Misty Moon. It was about four stories up uh, the club. I think there was a club in the basement, which is I didn't know was a gay bar. I'm not really good with picking up on things like that. <laughs> and then the second floor, like the main floor, was the Misty Moon kind of cabaret. And then, uh, yeah, there was uh, another floor, and then we are at the top, and it was mostly storage for the bar. There was, like, old bar stools up there. And then just, like, a hallway with a bunch of, like, just shitty, terrible rooms. You know? And, uh, yeah, so there was a bunch of cover bands up there. And, and Ooh, yeah, well, it's been ticking. There's a siren every three minutes, right? It's, yeah. <laughs> um, so, but Adrenaline was up there, like, t to us, like, the most famous, you know, you know thrashy, angry, mean metal band in Halifax we, we, we all worship just because they're they're gods of the time and then uh, across the hall was um, abhorrent which eventually turned into Gorbich okay. they're like just famous like brutal yeah they're they're gods and then yeah. uh, and then us but uh, since it was Sean's rehearsal space he played in a couple of other bands too and one was called we the weasel faced judge and it was one of my favorite bands of all time. And that it's actually a big influence of mine. I was already in this frame of mind, but then I would, you know, I would come early for Entrefist practice and Sean would be finishing with uh, the Weasel Faced Judge practice. And Dave, that guitar player, it was strange. He played, he played a Charvel really high and really strange, but he was more like a Zappa type guy. But that was a huge influence on me too. And there was, yeah, there was other bands, uh, I think it was Nocturnal and Axiom and bands that were still kind of just still traditional metal with like touches of thrash. And then there was one dude in one of those bands and he just approaches like, hey, I listen to you guys and I really dig what you're doing. And I hear all these parts for a second, second guitar. And we never really won that because I was such a, the one band that really solidified me wanting to play a guitar was a, uh, a Seattle band called Forced Entry, and they were a, a three-piece, and they did some really neat off-time stuff and almost tribally sounding stuff. I'm like, no, I kind of want to use that kind of template, and I think we can get everything done. But then we let uh, Jason St. George audition, and he played a couple of harmonies. I'm like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> so, and it was way heavier. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he joined for a while, and but then unfortunately, he was only in the band for. Yeah, maybe a year. I don't honestly. I think he only played one show with us, 
and uh, he took his own life in '91 ish, I believe. And so that was that was pretty tragic for us. And then I little un, unclear on some. I don't know if uh, I think Scott, yeah Scott was asked to leave after that, and it was just Sean and I. And then we got uh, Shigeki, and then and then Mark did join the band after we recorded our second demo. And he was uh, he's Honduran, so he's used to sort of different rhythms and stuff. So that actually really worked. He he I don't know if he shared the same concept as me as for a band, but his writing complemented a lot of my riffs really really good. So and then we just we rehearsed like mad just. It must have been a totally different attitude too, because it was kind of like now you've you've had the first iteration of Entropis, you've mm. done some shows, you've got a bit of a following going on, and now you're coming yeah. out and you're trying to write music again. You have a new form of nation and that, yeah. and you know that there are people waiting to hear what you guys oh, are yeah. going to do, right? So this totally changes everything. It was right? cool. I never thought I'd be in a band that would like it so much that you know. They never missed the show, or they're like begged for T-shirts and had stickers all over their stuff, and and like you know the, those riffs weren't really written to be hummed along, <laughs> you know a lot of them. I mean, some of them are, for contrast for the other stuff, are actually really simple and I guess catchy little hooky things, like you know the uh, chorus riff in an old song, into out, and it sounds like a nursery rhyme, do 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 do, like. Uh, I don't know, like just that gets stuck in people's heads. Like my son is singing that, and they're like, "What is that?" I'm like, "I don't know, son. Some Dr. Seuss uh, little thing that you must have heard somewhere." But um, yeah, so the writing. I know I'm getting better on my instrument. I'm basically just trying to survive around these real musicians. Like uh, yeah, so around Shigeki and Sean, and Mark had been playing a lot longer than me, and he was pretty good. And, and yeah, so the the last demo we recorded that into out demo was pretty good i mean i wish we had a, taken more time in the recording process like it's for the time it's not it's not super poor production it holds for a up demo. pretty well to this it, the, mu the music totally does because I, I hear people doing stuff today like totally what we were doing and we we're all about um yeah i mean i wish things were a little bit clearer a little bit more in your face and just a little bit too much bottom but all the demos we essentially we did ourselves i mean the first one was on a vcr the second one we did with a buddy in his studio but we still didn't really didn't know what we were doing that doesn't really sound very good there's some really cool kind of tunes and riffs and concepts on that demo but nobody really talks about that one because it wasn't really uh circulated or distributed into out is the most famous just because yeah we 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 purchased a ton of master tapes and they're all over. And plus, we were gotten popular in fanzines and stuff. So we were sending those out and getting good reviews. Which is something that's totally, like, like we, people nowadays don't get what that was all like. That was a whole universe yeah, into it itself. Was, right? It was kind of the end of that, that era. Because basically, when you got to the late 90s, that's when, I guess, you had, like, Napster and right. SoulSeek and all that stuff. stuff so right. I would imagine, like, 95, 96 was kind of the dwindling dates of the fanzine and the tape trading sort of right. thing, right? Yeah, totally. So I was happy to be like an actual part of it, not just a, like a fan of music taking part of it that way. But, you know, uh, Sean, our drummer, had a, a pretty good fanzine that was fairly popular in circulation. So he would get all the demos and, and he couldn't listen to them all. When you have a good fanzine, you're getting so much in the mail. So he would, you know, give each band member like, 10 cassettes and like let me know what you think of these if there's anything good i'll do a real review of it but his reviews are always so just so horribly harsh and biased uh, so yeah well because if nothing was better than his playing standards he would just crush it and i that was horrible to me because i'd listen to these things like man there's a really cool part and idea here he's like uh drummer sucks i'm not listening to that <laughs> but whatever, that's just okay. part, part of his character. Bedford? Or? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's total Bedford. But the thing is, he was such an incredible musician, right? So, but that was the challenge of that band, is just listening to him talk about himself at every practice. It, it wore really, really thin. Which uh, helps me kind of transition to us, like, there's never a happy ending to a band. And 
no exception yeah. being uh, Entrophis. Uh, so things kind of yeah, things didn't definitely didn't go the way you wanted to. Anybody no, wanted to. I mean, but, uh, it was it so long ago. Yeah. Um. You know. I mean, it was really strange. I mean, I nothing to hide. I mean, I'm. Uh, you know, Mark had some issues, but again, we're still pretty young, and, you know, I guess it does go to your head a little bit, like, you know, we're writing complicated music, and not that there's other bands a million times better than us, like, we love bands like Atheist and Cynic, like, those guys are studied musicians and real musicians, like, you know, yeah. to this day, music is pretty much the most important thing in my life, but I don't know if I'm a musician. Like, I just, I just have that, like, an insecurity and it's forever try to be humble. Like, I hear things that I do. I'm like, oh, that's fucking wicked. And, and people are, and I'm, but I'm just like, nah, there's eight-year-olds in Thailand making me look incredibly stupid. So, there, they can't, I just can't have any ego about it. Um, that was different for our drummer. There was just 24-7 ego and... And it's just like me, I just, I can't do that. I just can't be, and so for us to go four or five years or however long, that was an incredible stretch. So it's, it's yeah. almost like me working in an environment that's just stricken with uh, homophobia and racism. And I'm just, I can't do it. It's just not me. I can pretend for a little while and I'll try to be a good soldier and, and be a part of the team because I, I, I believe in that. But at the end of the day, it just it wears you. The weight is just too much. So the the I'm better than this person, or and just constantly, nonstop. That's it was ridiculous. But anywho, um, yeah, Mark, uh, Mark had some uh, some anger issues, and Ch uh, Sean approached me. We need to get Mark out of the band. And musically, it was working. It was really good, and but it was kind of kind of terrifying we had witnessed some incidents that was just not really cool and uh yeah so we we're gonna stage a breakup like break up the band and then basically reform in a few months without mark and i don't know what happened but at the same time sean mentioned that he wanted to write more commercial music he didn't he no longer wanted to do complex odd strange arrangements he, this is a quote from Sean himself, I want to sound like Napalm Death. And I said, well, there's already a Napalm Death, and there's a million bands out there wanting to sound like Napalm Death. So, but I think it's kind of my own fault, because after the Into Out demo, this is what really sucks. It wouldn't have been so bad if we had recorded the five songs beyond the Into Out demo. The Into Out demo was really the beginning of, like, the Entrophist sound. Like the first two demos, totally all that stuff was there, but it was still, the into out is like, okay, now the strides, the songs, and the, like, yeah. But then there was five songs after. There was Retrieve the Axis, which is like the 16-minute, 70-something riff song. was absolutely ridiculous. It was like half our set. It was <laughs> fucking nuts. And people would just almost like sit down. At yeah. the gig, like what is going on? Like I had the Ensonic sampler and and all this weird atmosphere. Dude, I'm getting goosebumps right now. Like it was messed up. Like it was, and that was inspired by that old uh, prog band Abacost from, and they were all Bedford guys. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we had all these incredible songs, but then Sean basically gave up, almost gave up on playing technical drums. Sounds like a certain drummer in a band that I used to love until they made a, a very uh, dark covered album cover and uh yeah I basically wanted to sell out right so i'm like dude we've got this big following this is our, this is our thing we've you know we've had like label interest and based on what we're doing and we're like let's we'll blow up the band and we'll bring it back together and we'll re we'll record these songs and then see what happens and so the band broke up and then mark must have did a back door deal to like okay I'll do the napalm death thing and then I was out of my own band yeah. my logo my name yeah. well the name that I stole, stole. yeah <laughs> with sort of unverbalized permission and uh, all the lyrics like yeah. 
eighty percent of the writing. And what I didn't know is Sean mailed the name to himself, which is a form of patent patenting things, right? Copy copyright. If you write down I hereby claim the band name Metrophist on this date, nineteen blah blah blah, and you mail it to yourself and you don't open it, that holds up in court. Which is a really good that was a great life lesson for me because I've done that a million times. So I basically got robbed and booted out of my own band and I was crushed because like my fourth I had dude the songs we had written, there was uh Think as Mutant, uh Is Can't Breathe can't breathe was that was i bet that was the song because it was fucking not it was it was all like straightforward kind of grind floor and i think by us doing that song you know i think we played it a couple when we opened for entombed i think we played it and that was all the entombed guys were up the side of the stage like and i'm just like this is nuts like one of my favorite bands is like looking at us with awe i'm just like this doesn't make sense to me right mm -hmm. this is amazing but it was it was nuts. It was freaking crazy. It was stupid. But it was really fun. And I think Sean's like, I just kind of want to do this now. So like a terrorizer, napalm death, kind of a more of a grindy type band. And so any, anywho, it fizzled out. Yeah. It was re it was really bummed out. And they kept using my name. And they grabbed uh, a, well someone I thought was a friend of mine to basically impersonate. Jake Evans is the front man of the band. I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm not a violent person, but yeah, I, I really did want to choke the life out of these people. <laughs> and like, yeah. you can't, it's one, th they just should have changed the name. Just change the name. It's a different band. But that's weak. When you, when you try to ride off the reputation and, you know, and like the coattails, that was a, a lot of my concept. It was really hurtful. Yeah, but I mean that would be, that would become quite a theme in my life, just like <laughs> like teaching kids and stuff. And I don't know, I'm too friendly, I'm too nice, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> but I mean, it's been a crazy journey, hasn't it? I mean, you're into the dance stuff, finding yeah. your way to Penticton. I mean, all the different things that you've been through. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's some really like kind of bum you out things. But again, I don't look at at life like that, like. Pfft. Oh man, like, like again, if we had recorded those last songs, I would have been like, okay, that's awesome. That's a good chapter, chapter. I can close it out. But it was just like so much awesomeness left hanging. Because people still to this day email me out of the blue or message me like, man, I threw on into out the other day. Like, what the hell? How did you guys do that? Like way back then. I'm like, man, I have no idea. We were just, the creative juices were flowing. Yeah. I'm like in my early 20s at not really playing the guitar that long just seeing it as an ultimate vessel to create strange art yeah. and it was just a, like a really really cool time but i'm just really bummed that those those songs weren't recorded but it was awesome like there was the shows were awesome the the reaction was awesome fortunately i still have a couple of recordings and and you know it's not like uh i'm not able to play music you know i've got current projects that i'm super stoked about and, you know, I'll be able to do it all again. And so it's, you know, fortunately, too, when that blew up, um, uh, Adrenaline, the, like the original Halifax, Nova Scotia, you know, Thrashers, um, that band kind of dissolved, too. And Todd Zaney, the singer of that band, who's this absolute legend in Halifax, asked me if I wanted to play guitar on a new version of Adrenaline. So I was just like... I couldn't get my gear from one room to the next fast enough. So, but it's, you know, we kind of sat there and like, well, what do we want to do? I, we're not going to play old adrenaline songs. And then we're like, we're not going to write like Etrevis type songs because that just totally doesn't work. So, I mean, and I've always been a fan of kind of hardcore. And so we just took my, my B tuned guitar and wrote sort of, crossover type stuff and it was right in the middle and with Todd's vocals and, and and we recruited that drummer from that old that high school talent show band that my first gig was uh, Nick who basically was became the drummer for Gorbage right and he b blossomed into an incredible drummer 
like versatile, but he, he could do a double kick and all that stuff. So really worked really, really well. So, and then that version of adrenaline is basically kind of adrenaline 2.0. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. We did that for years. And yeah, I did a couple demos, and so that kind of came out of those two bands kind of ending. So mm. yeah, it was kind of neat. But I don't know. Any more questions about the actual scene? And well, the, that's what I was about to say. Is like it's just so crazy to imagine that rehearsal space. There was Entrefist, There was Adrenaline. Pretty there much was everybody early was days there. of Gorbage or uh, Abhorrent. 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 And yeah. Like that's such a thing and, yeah. that it's like you can only imagine it really. And like, is there anything that you would want to say to like to anybody who would be listening to this that was was brown back then was part of the scene oh not... I, everybody that was up in those jam rooms like i love them all even the the wannabe poser glammy guys because they were all cool cool guys and everyone i mean we put up with a lot of shit there because the the bouncers from that club would come up there and do do coke off of bar stools and you know uh um have their way with kind of groupy each <laughs> and you know you'd have to kind of step over them in the stairwells like to get up to your jam room and it was really it was out of a movie it really was i mean it wasn't like you know anything like cbgb's or anything like that but it was really really funny there's many a late night like drinking session and so many strange side projects just from people grabbing instruments and pounding you know i ended up playing drums in this band called gut mash with like the singer and bass player from Gorbage and we actually like played a couple of shows in between teardowns. It's just it's just stuff like that. It was so funny. You know, putting my head through one of the windows and throwing <laughs> cymbals out the windows to hear what they would sound like on the street. You know, people dropping cases of beer on prostitutes below and pimps trying to kill us and everyone that was a part of that. And my girlfriend at the time which is uh, Sarah Dunsworth of Trailer Park Boys fame. She was my girlfriend through all of this. So she witnessed and photographed and documented and wrote poetry about all this stuff. And it's just absolutely hilarious. It drew pictures. Like, she's just so artistic and creative. And, uh, yeah, like, she was basically witness to all of that. So, I mean, I don't talk to her a lot, but every – to this day like but i could i could message her right now like hey remember that time and she would just dial up and be like yeah how did we even like live through that stuff <laughs> so you know and i mean we'd like we'd spend the night in those places and just it was hilarious it was absolute mm -hmm. pandemonium and yeah everything chaotic like that yeah. could happen up there yeah. but yeah all those people that were involved with that scene at that time like great memories even like the what the memories of like that just weren't cool and like the shit if i had to like put it all in a bubble i'm like oh yeah i would i would love to do all that again <laughs> just you know just you know the just from the the guy working the cash at the gas station across the street because we'd always go get snacks there before jam and i'll never forget you know those uh little cans of uh, cocktail wieners okay yeah <laughs> anyway i'll never forget this character we'd always see him just like uh, you know the movie like clerks yeah or yeah just just like that <laughs> and i'm like reaching for that can and the guy's like a few aisles over and he just picks it he's like don't <laughs> and my hand slowly recoils and it's just <laughs> just it's so profound like it's like a movie like it happened yesterday dude that was like 1992 right it's like don't like, man, that's what, 28 years ago? It's a scene from a movie. It's so funny. Just shit like that. And yeah, the, that uh, that rehearsal space. I mean, it wasn't our only rehearsal space. We had some other crazy ones. But that one is just absolute legendary. All those bands. Yeah, I remember Adrenaline coming down to watch us. And the bass player, uh, Craig, who I went to high school, he was like Adrenaline's like, fourth or fifth bass player. But he got into the band. This is even before I started playing playing guitar but now i'm in the rehearsal spot they came down to watch and craig had these super short shorts on and he had his like knees apart and his friggin scrotum was hanging out of his shorts and nobody said anything and it was this weird awkward and we're playing and everybody knew but craig and craig i love you buddy but holy fuck that was the most 
fucking surreal abstract day ever because <laughs> your shit is just like hanging out bro <laughs> and yeah if i if i message like you know like any of the dudes that were there in that room today like hey remember uh that day with craig langell and i wouldn't even have to say it like oh this bag hanging out of his shorts <laughs> just so much shit like that and it's just like we're just all young and super like hungry metalheads and there's so many scenes i could put together like a whole trilogy movies of like <laughs> yeah what would you say to anybody who's trying to chase their dreams uh don't have something to fall back on <laughs> <laughs> oh because i've heard i heard that so many times it just it doesn't matter it doesn't matter absolutely do it i mean i've I followed a bunch of different dreams and odd ones at that and kind of fluked out, became somewhat successful at it. I mean, how do you go from a kind of a, a, a touring, technical, death metal, psycho freak band to teaching dance for a living? Yeah. Like, that's bizarre. Yeah. But that's, that's kind of who I am. I just, uh, extremes and, yeah, so... Um, you know, I'm just a white dude from Halifax. How on earth should I be able to effectively instruct urban dance, of all things? <laughs> but the thing is, I'd never be able to do that without a musical background. And I'd never be able to do music without an artistic background. So, you know, from as long as I can remember, you know, like three, four, and five years old, I never went anywhere without like a pad of paper and markers. So I just, I just drew everything and color outside the lines, make the colors that aren't supposed to break all those rules. It's, mm -hmm. it's fun. There's rules and you know, some rules you, you really kind of should follow, but it's when you celebrate breaking the rules and then making something like that kind of a dream that you want to follow, have like, have fun in life for sure. Like go yeah. for it. Yeah. Like, I mean, and, you know, I, I care about people and kids and safety of neighborhoods and, and all that stuff. And I can be a really strange, odd musician making angry music and uh, doing dance moves and still riding around on skateboards and BMX bikes, like, into my late 40s and 50s. And, and you really can kind of do what you want. I mean, as long as you're, you're not harming anybody or trying to get in their way. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, the world keeps kind of changing in, in extreme ways. Yeah. I mean, the world is, you know, I'll be 49 in a month. And the world is, to me, has profoundly changed at least four or five times. Like radically different. Like you can kind of, well, it, wasn't, it really wasn't like that five or six years ago. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if music has changed so much now. Now we're in really technological stuff. Yeah. I mean, I can write a song and record it and have it, a million people could hear it by the end of the night. Yeah. So that's kind of freaky. But as far as uh, doing your thing, hell yeah, do it. Break rules. Might as well, right? Well, absolutely. What's, I don't know. <laughs> people don't need extreme wealth. Yeah. You, you just don't need that. If you told me... I, I could be employed, and I, you know, I know the cost of living goes up and whatever. But say, like in today's age, like if you told me I'd make say thirty five thousand dollars a year the rest of my life or to, uh, to retirement, and you know, just a regular kind of nine to five or an equivalent, and you know, I would do it. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't need more than that. Yeah. You know, we where we live in Penticton, you you don't really need a vehicle. I mean, we have them because we want to do things and, and go places, but it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. If I, you know, if I work down the street and I have a bike, you know, I just I don't need things. And yeah. like for music, I don't I don't need to be paid for music. Mm -hmm. So if your fall if your dream is to be paid for music, and really, I've uh, been in close contact with those types of people i can't knock it too much but to me music really is art first and it's has nothing to do i mean a lot of the bands i love yeah they've made albums and sold merch and that's the thing and they and that's that's incredible that's that's fantastic 
But when you're setting out, and if that's kind of like part of your dream, is like, well, I need to be popular, and I need to be, have, drive this vehicle, and live in yeah. this house. Nah, it's not, that's not really a, an interest of me. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, I rent a house, we jam in it. You know, here in Penticton, we live close to, like, uh, mountains and trails and beaches, and, you know, it's pretty hard to be miserable here. <laughs> you know, we've got issues like any other community does. That will that are really good fuel for for angry song stuff, but all the music that I create is drawn from this really past uh, experiences. I guess it's half and half. I've got a couple of new songs that are really inspired by uh, recent events. <laughs> so there's no shortage. There's yeah. no shortage. I'm, you know, I do see the beauty in life and in people, and yeah. and want to be happy that way. But when I when I get behind an instrument. I want it to just sound it's just like a really weird abstract hell unleashed <laughs> and I love contrasts and, you know beautiful little plankle things that just destroy with this morbid off time thing it's fun for me <laughs> <laughs> nice I love it alright thank you so much for taking time to talk to me and uh, awesome. everybody this has been Jake Evans thanks for listening and take care of yourself man cool man you too thank you